Paul was not a headline hunter, was not a glamour boy, quite obviously. He was representing the voiceless, and sometimes stands he took were unfashionable. He was odd. Not that many people wore the bow ties, or had stentorian voices like that, or wore the Coke bottle glasses. But very few people were that bright, had that much integrity, were so solid on public policy, and were so sincere. There are some politicians who are reliable. What you see is what you get, and you begin to feel that you know them. Paul Simon, you knew him, you knew what you got. He talked to the people in, I think, um, a populist kind of conversation that never failed to hit some of the right chimes every time. He believed very strongly uh, that government should be both open, accountable, uh, and responsible. And uh, I would think I would add, uh, from because it was Paul Simon, progressive. He made up his own mind and was fearless about expressing it. And I expect over the course of a career aggravated more people who thought, well, I can't understand why Paul would be doing this or that. But he was absolutely always his own man. For just pure decency and public service, he was right at the top. And it, it didn't make any difference to me what his party politics were. He served as a congressman or a senator. I served as a governor. We both had the same job, get stuff done for the people of Illinois. He brought dignity to this business. I always thought when Paul Simon talked about the role of a politician, you could hold your head up high. You didn't have to apologize and say, oh, I'm a politician. I couldn't do any better in life. He made you feel, and I, I believe, it's the greatest thing, the greatest calling you can have. Paul Simon was already a world traveler when he was born on Thanksgiving Day, 1928, in Eugene, Oregon, to Lutheran missionaries Ruth and the Reverend Martin Simon. We could actually stamp Paul made in China because we were only back in the States about a month when, when Paul was born. So that was uh, kind of a rough trip for some people, but uh, that didn't bother me too much. My parents clearly instilled in me uh, a sense of what life is all about and that you're here not just to live and pile up money or fame or whatever for yourself, you're here to serve others. He grew up in a very cosmopolitan household where sort of the web of life theme was important and it's a little mystic and uh, yet I think it was deeply ingrained in his religious background and in, in that Lutheran home that he grew up in. My religious beliefs, for example, uh, tell me you ought to help poor people. Now, my father lived that. He preached that. He grew up on a dairy farm. And uh, I remember my dad saying, uh, even, even your cows ought to know that you're a Christian. You know, meaning you have to treat animals with respect as well as people with respect. And um, I believe that's what we have to do. A kind of uh, basic uh, philosophy in government. Uh, I did have one, uh, I think, uh, life-shaping experience. Uh, February of 1942, the President of the United States ordered 120,000 Japanese Americans away from their homes said they had one to three days to sell all their property, put everything they own into one suitcase. Um, and you, this was, you know, two months after the start of the war, there was this patriotic fervor. Uh, but not a one of those 120,000 people had committed a crime. Um, my father stood up and said, this is wrong. And I can remember the hate phone calls, and uh, I was 13 at the time, and my friends making fun of me. And uh, I, I regretted my father had done that. I was embarrassed. Now that I look back on his life, it's one of the things I'm proudest of him for.